Good to have everybody today talk about growth and authenticity. Um, so thank you to our panelists, who I will introduce in a moment for being here. Thank you to South By for having us. And thank you to all of you for giving up an hour of your lives to hear us talk. Hopefully, we'll make it worthwhile for you. So 2016 is Van's 50th anniversary, and we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how we got here, how we managed to survive some really bad decisions over the years, and why people still like us. And uh, what's pretty clear is that at times we've lost sight of our true identity. Um, and that's when the business has suffered the most, to be honest, in 50 years. And conversely, the investment that we've made for the past 15 years or so to rekindle the core of our brand, which is rooted in skateboarding and punk rock, um, has fueled our growth and success. So what do we learn from that, right? How do you marry up remaining true to yourself and growing your brand at the same time? How do you make tough choices when the two things can be at odds, right? Uh, we hope to unlock some of those answers today, and I have three uh, very esteemed colleagues here to help me answer those questions. Um, so to introduce our three panelists, I went out to them ahead of time, and I asked them three questions. I asked them to remember their favorite concert of all time. I asked them to talk about their favorite city and why, and whether they prefer vinyl or streaming and why. And I got some great answers. So uh, first, I'll click here. Nate, do you want to say something about this? Oh, this just showed up on uh, social media the other day. This is the one and only time I went to uh, a prom. And oh. <laughs> you, had, you, needed, you needed to you know, wear, dress up and, and go formal, but I needed to be, uh, you know, I wasn't going to go all the way. I had to be myself. So I thought it'd be appropriate to show me wearing the Vans at my, at my prom there. That is awesome. That's some, uh, some deep, deep 80s there. <laughs> That is serious authenticity there, Nate. Thank you for being willing to show that. So in that spirit, uh, let me introduce some people. Um, the first person I want to introduce you to is Mish Wei. Mish Wei's band is called White Long. We were very fortunate to have Mish and her band play last night at the House of Vans up the street. So thank you, Mish. That was a great show. Thank you. As usual. Um, and Mish, uh, Mish, in addition to being White Long, is Canadian. So thank you for being mm -hmm. Canadian. As well. Um, so, M Mish gave a great answer to the question about her favorite concert. She said, and I'm just, I, I were just going to say this one verbatim. She said, do you understand how hard this is to answer? I've spent my life at shows. My mind goes into this blank swarm when I'm trying to think of the best show I've ever seen. It turns to mush. Yeah, I don't, can't remember. I don't know. <laughs> okay, it's good. Like I'd have to sit for hours. All right, Mish's favorite city remains Los Angeles, California, where she lives today. Mish mm -hmm. says that, um, that she loves it even when she hates it, which I think a lot of us who are from L.A. feel that way about it. I'm, I'm in the same boat. Um, and again, because she's Canadian, she remains infatuated with things like palm trees and cactus plants, yeah. which are very alien beings to people from Canada. Yes. All right. Uh, on the vinyl versus streaming debate, um, Mish sees the value in both. She says that anything mastered before the year 2000 in vinyl is excellent quality-wise. Uh, but, but she makes a point to say she's not a vinyl snob. And she likes having 90 records on her phone at all times. Yeah. <laughs> so the combination's pretty good. All right. So Mish, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Next up is Walter Schreifels. Is that how, did I say that correctly? Yeah, I think so. OK. Thank you, Walter. Walter, uh, Walter um, you may know from Gorilla Biscuits, which is a great friend of Vans. So thank you for all the years of that, uh, Walter. And uh, also Youth of Today, Quicksand, his own solo work. Um, Walter's fairly prolific. Uh, so Walter's all-time favorite show is a very tough split between Fugazi with Shudder to Think at the Ritz and My Bloody Valentine opening for Dinosaur Jr., also at the Ritz. So you'll have to tell us what's amazing about the Ritz. The Ritz was the, uh, was the original Studio 54 in New York, but at that time they called it the Ritz, and it was like a cool historic venue. But um, those shows were just great. I mean, Fugazi were, uh, at that time, just uh, for anybody who's familiar with them, were just on all cylinders, just amazing musicians and... Uh, the energy of everything from hardcore that I liked uh, with reggae elements and politics and emotional, you know, content, everything happening. And 
that was magic. But I mean, there's so many other great shows that I've seen, but I don't know, those hit me really strong. And My Bloody Valentine were just kind of um, at their peak, I think, too. And I guess everyone has like a cool show that they think was the one, but I, I, I think I have so many. Uh, as a musician, I've seen so many great bands and played with so many, but. Well, those, thank you for taking yeah. a stab at too. Yeah. Appreciate no. that. Um, in the context of besides New York, Walter's favorite city is Berlin, Germany. It's rich history, beautiful ruins, canals, lakes, diverse population, art and music scenes, affordability, youth, bike lanes. Uh, it's at the heart of Europe culturally right now, for sure. And those of us who have been fortunate enough to go there would concur. Regarding the vinyl versus streaming debate, Walter finds the room for multiple formats, so that's kind of a, a, a theme, right? He likes the ease of streaming and the ability to take in the wider range of influences, but he buys vinyl new and old for the tactile experience and also obviously the general superior sound quality of, of vinyl. And uh, Walter makes a shout out for us old timers for reel to reel <laughs> as well. So thank you for that, that was, that was awesome. I really like that. And then Nate. Okay, the age-old question for Nate. Mendel, Mendel, where do you put the emphasis? I think it's Mendel, but I say Mendel. Uh, that that doesn't make I any think sense, I've been Nate. I doing it wrong. For, uh, <laughs> I'm serious. I go Mendel. Okay, we're going to say either. Yeah. It's Nate. Uh -huh. yeah. Nate, thank you for being with us today. Nate just flew in overnight back from um, Brooklyn to be with us with a uh, baby in tow. So thank you for the extra special effort to be here. Much appreciated. Um, Nate plays bass for the Foo Fighters. I hope that's not news to anybody here. Also, a um, much beloved Sunny Day Real Estate, which uh, a lot of us know Nate from, so thank you for that, Nate. Uh, so Nate's favorite concert of all time, I love this one, this is one, um, on my list too. Uh, his first ever legitimate hardcore show with Dead Kennedys, Crucifix, and Green River at the Moore Theater in Seattle. What year was that, Nate, do you remember? I think 84. 84, yeah. okay, yeah. I saw DK in 84 in Los Angeles. It was incredible. Uh, okay, this was a very interesting. Nate's favorite city at the moment is Pittsburgh. Um, Nate, true story. He, he wasn't saying that to be ironic. He really <laughs> believes that. Um, Nate loves that the place has reinvent, reinvented itself from a sad Rust Belt story into a happening modern city. And you were just there when you, when you wrote this. So Pittsburgh. Yeah, I like the old Midwest Rust Belt cities. Cincinnati, uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. This is that maybe because cool. I'm from the West Coast, and I just I know it so well. And there's something sort of enchanting about the East Coast and right. that Midwest area. I, I love it. I mean, how do you pick your favorite city? It's kind no, of no, I like that. I mean, though. I, it was kind of a, it was kind of a stab. Yeah, that was I mean, original. Dark, okay, on the yeah. vinyl versus streaming debate, <laughs> Nate prefers vinyl if he really wants to listen to something, and streaming if he needs to just put on something specific or put on something that he can just forget about. Okay, so I thought that'd be at least a little bit interesting way to introduce people you probably are, guys already know anyway. Um, and let's get into the topic at hand today, which is growth and authenticity. Um, so I have five big questions that I'm gonna ask these guys, and then we will leave time for Q&A as well, so be thinking about what questions you guys have. I'll make sure to get to every, as many people as we can in our hour. The first question of the day is, what is your personal take on the age-old tug of war between art and commerce. And I'm gonna ask Nate to start because his band just came off a big tour playing big shows in big venues mm -hmm. um, in a big rock band. And what's that tug of war like been for you, Nate? Well, I don't, I don't believe that there's necessarily a right answer on this. I think it depends on the person and the situation. You know, I think for some people, the idea that your art is, is precious and as soon as it reaches uh, you know, the, the oxygen of an open room, it's, it becomes something else. And that, that works for them. And, you know, the classic example of that would be Fugazi and the way that they, they run their band or did run their band. Uh, and then other people make commercial music that I think is, uh, uh, that's perfectly viable, like that's, that's programmed to be popular. And that can be just, that can be just fine as well. Um, I, I grew up in an environment where that, you know, I wasn't as, favorable towards that yeah. as, as other people. Like I, I lean towards people that uh, have less commercialized music. I think that we've, you know, we're in a, a hyper commercialized space almost all the time. I mean, look at walking through this convention center here. You know, like I, I couldn't find my way to, 
to register because you know there's insurance booths and Mazda yeah. booths everywhere. And right. you know I understand that that's a commercial necessity for us all to be here and for there to be a music conference. Someone's got to pay for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that a lot of time is the, the trade off that we make. But non commercialized spaces, I think, are really important. And, and music is a great space to have be commercial free. Um, ever since I, I started doing you know, music for a living in the 90s, there's been opportunity after opportunity to uh, to, to answer this question for for me and my bands. And we've you know, we've done it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that um, the Foo Fighters has gotten more popular over the years with, without doing a lot of that. You know, we play a lot of branded spaces. Uh, occasionally, we'll partner with uh, corporations in order to, more often than not, in order to do a specific project. We, were, we actually almost did something with Vans. We had an idea right. that, was, that, was, um, that we would go out and do uh, our very first van tour in the same van at the same venues on the same dates 20 years later. And that would be very expensive for us. And the only way that we could do that is if we had a partner to help us. Right. And so that's a creative project. And if you can partner with somebody and have it happen, then, then that's great, especially if it makes sense. Now, that ended up not working out uh, for, for either of us, fans or the band. But that's, that's, I think, is a good example of how you can marry the two. Um, Another example of when it hasn't worked out for us is, uh, and this is so weird to, to, to say, but so coming from <laughs> punk rock backgrounds we're talking about now, but we've been, uh, Foo Fighters have been in the running to do the Super Bowl before, which is in, I in didn't some know ways. That. In, Interesting. Okay. It, yeah. We, we didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, and that is as hyper commercialized a space as you can possibly imagine. So we were. At, at the time when we were in the running, we, we, we did want to do it. We, th we thought it would make sense for us, and that would be very difficult because anybody that's seen a Super, Super Bowl halftime show knows what's involved. There's going to be guests, and they may not be guests that fit well with your band, uh, and then they like to have a big production. And our band is a fairly straightforward rock band. You know, when we travel now, we've got um, lights and video screens, but we don't have... Uh, you know, dancers and props, things like that. It doesn't fit with us, and I probably would have wa probably would have wanted that. In any case, we decided that we didn't want to pursue that any any longer because they changed their policy and they want fans to pay to go and play the Super Bowl. And for us, it's like, well, we're not going to we're not going to do that. We'll just go play another show and and we'll leave that behind. Yeah. Um, car companies have said, you know, we want to put your you know, we want to do a Foo Fighters branded car and, you know, give it away or something like that. And it's like, well, we don't need to be that closely associated. That's a good example of, uh, for me, of that there's not really any benefit for that, mm -hmm. for us as a band. It doesn't help us make music. It doesn't help us fulfill any sort of creative purpose. It's just being in league with a car company. Okay. You know, maybe, maybe getting a, a large check. That didn't, that didn't work, so we didn't do that. Got it. Um, I think that's enough for me. There's okay. people All right, cool. Talk. Thanks. M Mish, has, has the art and commerce thing been a tug of war for you as White Long has developed? Well, um, in a way, but I think that, like what Nate was saying, when you come from a specific scene that is very anti that and you start to grow, you're, it changes. You start to, when your music, which is something that was always a hobby or something you did because you love, becomes work. Then, then that's when this starts to exist. Um, and I think you have to just, as long as you are okay with the exchange you're making at the end of the day, that's what matters. And th there's no, this is the right way to do it, this is the wrong way to do it, you're a sellout for this, whatever. That doesn't make sense to me. I think it's just your own integrity, how you move along. We also have to be realistic. I mean, now it's like bands do not, <laughs> you don't make, Tons of money. I mean, Foo Fighters, that's a different story. You're like older. <laughs> but, you know, like, it's starting at a different point. I mean, my band came up at a different time when things flipped. And I feel like um, it's, it's okay to make that exchange if you believe in the company and you believe in what you're doing. It's, it's case by case. Okay. You have to be realistic. Okay. Yeah, I think Walter. it's if you're your relationship to your art and how you feel about it. I think you can, I mean, coming up in the scenes that I came up in, I think we all kind of started in, the idea was that it would never be popular, so you would never yeah. really have this tug of war between commerce because uh, 
there was no commerce to it. That was just not happening. And as soon as that kind of changed and became a, more of a professional thing, then I think you have to make certain decisions and how you feel about your own music or your own art. I mean, in this like hyper commercialized consumer culture where you're constantly being inundated with, you know, people trying to sell you this, that, or the other through your phone or wherever you're walking, um, I think it definitely comes up. But I think the the bar has been I don't know, back in the day, you, you could be called a sellout for so much less. Uh, <laughs> you know, things have become easier on the sellout front, I think, to where you can, um, you have to exist and there's not, a, there's not this major label system to kind of uh, carry you through it. So sometimes you will uh, be faced with choices. I know a band that took a commercial with, um, one of the tobacco companies, they're just like, screw it, we smoke cigarettes, let's do it. We need the money. And uh, another band would be like, there's no way we're taking that. And whether that makes you authentic, I mean, they're being authentic to themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think it gets to be very, um, you know, confusing. And what, what does that really mean? I think it's your own personal relationship to your, to your art and who you're expecting to be attracted to it and who you're trying to draw into the room. And I think that's probably just true with most stuff, you know. Um, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, Nate, just a quick follow-up question for you before we move on to the next big topic. Mm -hmm. um, the concept of controlling the commerce as you get bigger, mm -hmm. do you, you have such a big apparatus around foos at this point, right? There's so many different people involved in propelling that brand. Do you have to remain directly involved in all the decisions about commercialization? And how does the band, is it a democracy? Is it an autocracy? How does it actually work when it comes to making these decisions that come up, must come up almost every day at this point? The band sets the tone, and then we've got people that help with some of the decisions. Some things okay. go, what happens is that it, it, we have management that acts as a filter that, okay. that we've worked with for 20 years and understands the principles of the band, and, and we'll come, we'll filter out a lot of things, and then we'll come to the band with, like, here's an opportunity, how do you feel about it? All right, so some and, of the, a lot of the things you'll never even hear about, let's put it that way. Yeah. If, yeah, if they're just overtly wrong for foos, you would hope that the, you guys would never even know about them. Yeah, but then there's some creative things like um, our merchandise, which is, you know, it's not a couple of t-shirts anymore. It's a, it's a giant merchandise stand that can be at, a, at a, you know, an arena or a, a stadium. And it's, there's a lot of moving parts there. And, and I help with that. I, I approve all the designs. And that's, honestly, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a struggle for me because uh, my aesthetic as a person isn't the aesthetic of my band necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so I have to look at that. And... Uh, the, the people that, that run the merchandise company will say, <laughs> this actually just happened. Um, Japan's really big right now, so here's some, here's some Japanese-themed designs. And they don't have anything to do with our band. It's like mm -hmm. Foo Fighters and a bonsai tree. <laughs> like, you know, and it's like, okay, well, there's a random image in our band's name, and some of our fans may want to buy that. And I have to make that decision. Like, is that what we want to do, or do we want to put something on a T-shirt that might you know, represent more of what we are about as a band and nobody would want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we have shirts with bonsais on them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, All right let, let's go on to the next question. How do you maintain an equilibrium between success and authenticity as your career develops? Mish, you want to talk about this one first? What does that equilibrium feel like for you? And have there been times when you felt kind of icky about overstepping the commercial side or, le or, or left a bunch of money on the table by being true, like, too true to your art. It I haven't had a situation yet where I feel icky about anything, and I, 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 I'm of the school where I'd like to take opportunities. I don't think there's any wrong, anything wrong with progressing and being more successful and re reaching a wider audience. Like, my band is at a very different level and these two gentlemen, but again, it's like the same thing I just said. I mean, it's all up to you, and I haven't had anyone push anything on me that I would have resisted, and, and it's like he's, Nate said with the filter, you know, when you have a great team working for you, they're not going to let things come your way that you know aren't going to click with you okay. in your band. I mean, I really... I, 
it's it's all it's just you know when something's not right okay walter has the equilibrium thing been a challenge at all in your career with um, the different bands you've been a part of i mean there's things that'll just cost you points if you do something corny your fans will be like think it's corny if you play this show uh or the ticket price is too high or it's sponsored by somebody you know not cool or something like that all those <coughs> all those little things add up and you have a certain amount of currency to where you can kind of take a risk on that but i think it's it's generally your own uh, for me i feel like you know i don't know if authenticity is what it's about it's just like making the decisions that you feel will still you don't want to feel icky i mean because that's just going to lead to I mean, I don't know, you could get lucky making icky decisions and all of a sudden you're more successful, but I think generally, like, if you, if you do those kind of things and people start to pick up on it, and then usually... Uh, it's a short-lived success. Yeah, kind of yeah. like you'll take the, it's, you know, you take this big money for whatever it is. I mean, when big money comes up, that's cool. You've got to consider it. But um, what are you endorsing and how does that affect, you know, the brand, you know, yeah. and, and, and your personal relationship to it because, you know, you're trying to, like, make some art or to get in people's heads or get in people's hearts and if you put that in between it they're thinking about some other thing you know you see it even in the in in you know bernie sanders not taking money from these these super packs or whatever you know what i mean from these corp uh wall street people he's using that as a as a wedge to say like this is my deal mm -hmm. and i think mm -hmm. i think that's being writ large in that way, but in our deal, it's, you know, are they playing that for that much money? Like, that's not cool. I'd rather see them here for this much money with those people. Yeah. And it, it, it takes a, take a hit for that sometimes. Okay. Hey, uh, Doug, so you mentioned that, uh, that Vans may have lost its way for a moment there. Yeah. Well, and many think, many I mean, times. That, 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 many so you, times. Why don't, why don't you, maybe you could talk a little bit about yeah, that. I'm interested in yeah. Vans. Oh, no. Steps. Okay. <laughs> Ser seriously, oh, though. for turning the tables, yeah. Nate. I really appreciate okay, that. Okay, can I just say something? I was Thank at you. the House of Vans in Brooklyn last night, and there's a, for the 50th anniversary, there's a, a history of Vans uh, display. And I had no idea that you guys had done uh, roller skates and skydiving shoes. What? Oh, dude, come on. The roller skates are amazing. So come maybe... On. Don't tell me you never liked roller skating, Nate. I, I love roller skating. I don't know if it's true to Vans, though. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, I mean, I, you know, the, um, the, the really cool... I'll keep this very short because everyone's here to, to hear you guys, not me. But what, one thing I love about Vans is it's a very imperfect brand. And we really embrace the imperfection of our brand. And that concept of that which does not kill you only makes you stronger is the absolute definition of our brand. Because we have so many evolutionary dead ends, the breakdancing shoes, the skydiving shoes, you, you name it. I mean, the roller skates, all that stuff, you know. The, this, the, our company has been through a bankruptcy and, and that was a, that's a lesson we talk about all the time because it was right after Fast Times at Ridgemont High, checkerboard slip-ons were the thing. The, the people that ran the company at the time sold the hell out of them to anybody that, that would be willing to take them. And they took that money and put it, in, put it into running shoes. Because mm -hmm. Vans means running. No, not, not even close. And, um, and, that, and that just drove us right down into bankruptcy. So I think that, that goes to, to Walter's point, which is you know, this idea of authenticity. If you're, if, you're, if you're doing something creative or in business, if... It, if if you start straying from what your actual purpose is, mm -hmm. people will smell a rat and you won't be successful. I mean, exactly. at what you're doing. That's just, that, that's the equation, right? Okay, yeah. so I don't want to put you on the spot since you put me on the spot. Is there, <laughs> can you think of a specific time when, when you wish you had a do-over now? Is there something that you said yes to um, on, the, on the, you know, furthering the commercialization of, of your music that you would, you would right now like to like take back and pretend it never happened? Uh, on the spot, things I can think of are um, photo shoots where this is like when our band was sort of finding its way in the late, late 90s and early 2000s, mm -hmm. we'd hire like a fashion photographer to do a, a photo shoot of our band. And we're not fashionable or especially attractive people. <laughs> we're not that band, you know? We're not 98 degrees or whatever. So, uh, and then we, they'd bring in uh, racks of designer clothes mm. and we wouldn't wear our own clothes and then we'd get these beautiful photos that should have been somebody else's faces. You know? Right, yeah. Uh, I remember one, there was, I wish I remember the photographer's name. 
we were in a field in a housing project outside of Dublin, and they kept horses, little white miniature horses, at the, on the bottom level of these housing projects. And we rented these horses and were on top of them <laughs> in these like fashion clothes. Oh, I got, where is that picture? Well, pictures from that photo session exist. There were, we were covered, we were in a shower and wet, and everybody was shaking their hair. You know, there's that one, and there's wow. that one on top of a double decker bus. It's like 2001 era okay. Foo Fighters. Funny story about the horse thing, though, is that the little kids that lived in the project were wrangling the horses, and one of them was strapped to the horse, and it took off running across the field. The oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> he was the kid was okay. All right, we will be we will all be Google imaging those photos yeah. later. Thank yeah, you, Nate. yeah. Uh, there's that, and uh, you know, around the same era, though, we did. Uh, there was this video called "Walking After You," and again, it was a fashion thing. Like it wasn't our it wasn't our band, but it's like we're gonna do the big video. We've got the the quieter song that may be like a crossover hit to top 40 instead of just rock radio, which will take the band to the next level. So let's, you know, let's do a really high budget um, like concept video with um, Dave and a woman and, uh, you know, this beautiful model woman and, and sort of acting out a, a romantic scene. Mm. And it was horrible and had nothing to do with our band. It's walking mm. after you if anyone ever looks at it. It's a it's an embarrassing video. <laughs> and that's, that's one example I can think of right now. Just okay. going yeah, I think totally videos straight. are kind of can be pretty embarrassing and lame. You got one you want to call out, Walter? Um, I would, <laughs> there was a video that uh, Quicksand did that was our big budget video, like swinging for the fences, called yeah. Freezing Process. And the director had just done Come As You Are, uh, had done a couple Nirvana videos, so he was really hot. And all the people at my record label were like, we got him on board and it's going to be sick and we're going to spend all this money. And uh, the song was called Freezing Process. And in the video, we got frozen. I get it. <laughs> and by getting frozen, that means we just put like white stuff on our face mm. and like snowflakes, like plastic snowflakes. And wow. that was the process that we went through in the video, creating the image of that. And it was like, we're doing that so that we could sell more records. Like I found it, I, I was trying to like, you know, pull a Mariah Carey and get out of this thing and the last day and they're just like, nope, we got to do it, you know, freeze up. So, uh... <laughs> Was there a swinging light bulb? Any... Yeah, there's swinging light bulb. Oh. All the same oh, crappy God. cliches of the 90s. <laughs> just like stock stuff and we never spent more money on a video. It was like a hundred thousand plus dollars on a video, which today would like fund, you know, so many bands and do so much good work around the world and we just wasted on this dumb video that got played like twice or we three should, times. We should do a project where bands take their own videos and oh. do voiceover, like, and... That like, would be like, director's, for cut, a director's cut. Director's cut, like, yeah. Beavis and Butthead, though. Making fun, yeah. yeah. Yeah, especially those of us that survived the 90s. Yes. yes. So yes. Good. You should do that. Yeah. But that's a... Des I mean, a video is basically a commercial for your band so that you can become more popular, and there's something desperate about that. Although, I think they can be really, really well done, and on occasion, you can be really proud of them and, and can be a fun exercise but obviously in a band your first thing is music and that connection to your fans so the video you know you can get into trouble especially at that time where they were such commercials really right right okay Miss, do you have a story you want to share, or should I move on? I just wanted to comment that I, I'm like this phase that you guys are talking about, I feel like my band's in this <laughs> process right now, so I should be back here in a couple of years being... Yes. But, you know, like, we're doing a, a new video coming up, and the label had a lot of demands about how it should be, and I was like, okay, well, if we're going to do it, if you, we're going to make a compromise. I'm going to have my friend who's a film director do it as a favor. I know it's going to be excellent, and we'll also, you know, we'll do these little things. Like, we'll make it work. I, I swear to God, as, as from one musician to another, just don't, seriously don't listen to them. I, yeah, I no, 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 that's what I'm saying. No, I'm like, okay, be... it's going to be my friend. We're going to do it this way. It's going to be, you know... We'll do the three aspects that you want, and then I'll do like this. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I wanted to have some pretty offensive things in there. That they said no. <laughs> but that, I mean, we made a compromise. We'll just so. do it. Do it without them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. I know you guys easy, will be having an interesting. This, yeah. this is the uh, struggle yeah. of the equilibrium that we're talking this about. This is exactly. the struggle. This is it. There you go. There it is. Okay, so on that note, um, how can brands play an additive role in music without being intrusive? Um, does playing a Vans venue feel different? And all three of you guys have played House of Vans, mm -hmm. and you can be honest, we can take it. 
does it change your attitude when you're playing a show at a branded venue or you're playing a brand showcase? Does that, does that feel different to you? Does it matter? How should brands be thinking about how to be additive to what you guys want to accomplish? Or is, is there a role there? Anyone? I think it depends on the brand. Okay. Like, yeah. I think, uh, luckily, Vans, to me, I associate it with Fast Times of Ridgemont High, uh, California, skateboarding, wearing the sneakers, being into it. And so, to me, it doesn't feel like um, foreign. It feels like part, like uh, some sort of thing that I've always been a part of. So, that connection makes it easy. And that Vans is reaching out in this way, I mean, to, to the music. I mean, we have a house of Vans in Williamsburg. You know, probably people have met and fallen in love at House of Vans shows. You know, things have happened there. So. Cool stuff has gone on. Maybe some people, you know, broke their arms there too. Or, you know, but it's like an actual thing that's happening in the community and that that's coming from a brand. You know, they're making money. Obviously, Vans is, is a company. But I think culturally, then that's cool. I don't think anyone really has any problem with that. But I think that there is... Um, you know, that kind of is, it, it hold, that's a rare space, I think, for a company. There's not too many companies that have that kind of connection. Uh, and I think that's what, what the choices that you make, you know. And if you pick the wrong company, um, you know, well, then there's, you know, it depends on how much money they give you, I suppose, and what it means to you, you mm -hmm. know, because you're going to take a hit, you know, because you're connecting to that brand, essentially. But I think... Some brands are cool, and it connects to your thing. It kind of is an endorsement. You know, it's like a, uh, you know, Gorilla Biscuits did a van, a sneaker, a van sneaker, and to me, that's really cool. That makes us look good, you know, as much as it connects okay. to that. But um, I don't think that's always the case. It depends on the brand, I think. Okay. Well, any other thoughts on the on relationship with brands? Or maybe even, time, you know, thinking about how lending your music to supporting a brand, how, how, that, would, how that feels. I don't, I don't, it doesn't feel very good. It doesn't? <laughs> no, I mean, like I said, there's, there's times, uh, I think the House of Vans is a good example, because you guys add something. You create a nice venue, you know, like the place in London that Foo Fighters played. Yeah. That's a venue that we would, nor we would ordinarily not get a chance to play. Those of you who don't know, it's, it's, a, it's under which station? It's under the v Victoria train station. It's the yeah, Victoria so, Tunnels. Yeah. yeah, so it's like a half of a, half of a circle. Uh, very cool, like long, skinny brick rooms. It's a, it's a, it used to be an old art space, and uh, it's part of the London Tube system. And uh, that's a very cool venue. And, and Van said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna take this space and turn it into a, a place for skateboarding and music. Great, you know, like we're happy to help you, you know, further your brand's image by playing here. Like that's that's a great compromise. Um, something like." What uh, the Foo Fighters have done from time to time, which is like play like a, like a beer brand's private event, you know, not the best. Mm. Doesn't feel great. I just <laughs> lost us so much money. <laughs> <laughs> does it? Sorry, does, guys. Nate, does it actually? Just, I'm just thinking about this from a fan's point of view. Does it actually change the way that you play that night? Yeah. What the, well, actually, one nice thing about it is it takes some of the pressure off. Because if you do your own show, and you guys can probably speak to this, uh, like, you're responsible. Yeah. Like, you picked uh, the venue. It's your fans that have come there. They've paid money to see your yeah. band, and you're responsible for people having a good time. Yeah. Okay. If you play, you know, some kind of more corporate event, uh, I know that we actually have a lot of fun at those. Because it's not a Foo Fighters show, really. It's like okay. we're, we're playing someone else's company party. Okay. And you know that the, fan, like the people that are watching may or may not be fans of the band. Yeah. And so that pressure to like do really well and read the, read the audience to make sure you're connecting and those kind of things that you usually feel, it's, it's diminished, which you wouldn't want all the time, but every once in a while, you get like casual Fridays. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you wear your Dockers. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yes. I think it's playing such a role nowadays in, in bands, too, like how they're, I mean, you look at the South by Southwest, there's, everybody is trying to, you know, <coughs> get more visibility for their brand here, and the, all the bands are trying to do that, too, but it's so, they're so working together in that. So I think maybe when I f first came up in the, the music scene that I came up with, that was just a, a bad 
look, but now it's just everywhere. So I think people that are listening to music don't look at it in such an intense way. Um, but I think it's always your own relationship with, to what you are doing and how do you feel about it. If you feel icky, you know, that's not good. M Mish, when you're younger in the, when your band is younger in the maturation process, when you're in like your nascent stages, mm -hmm. is, it, is it more important that you're, you're very, very cautious about those things or does it matter where in the, in the stages of your band's life you make those calls? Yeah, I mean, I can recall... I remember at one point Scion was wanting to really throw money into bands. And um, my band was on the West Coast and we had wanted to go to the East Coast and we had no money. None of us had any money. We could not fly there, we could not rent our own car, we could not we couldn't get there. And we also couldn't take enough time off our shitty day jobs to drive all you know what I mean, to do that big month long tour. And so they would give us a car in exchange for putting some photos up on Tumblr and Instagram. And we were, this is when we were playing like basements, you know, like crusty punk basements. And I remember these kids were giving me shit. And I was like, dude, you're the one that won't pay the $5 to come in here. You ask me if you can have my 7-inch for $2. Like, what am I supposed to do? You know, I want to play. I want to do this. So there's that. And I think there's you can get taken advantage of in that point. But it's, you know... That's a reality that mm. happens, so, especially uh, now. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to ask you that question. Yeah. Uh, you know, like in the hardcore scene that Walter and I grew up in, there was a very, you know, people were, could be fairly militant about the idea about selling out. You know, there was, yeah, there was yeah. lines, very... you, lines you didn't cross. And yeah. as you mentioned earlier, that, that, that those lines became blurrier sometime in the 90s and really the 2000s, you know, mm -hmm. when licensing your song and having a song being a commercial was like no big deal and everybody did it. And that was like a big note. Like no way would any band from like the early 90s like think about selling their song to oh, like a Gillette worst. commercial. Suicide. <laughs> and now it's like something that I think bands act, you know, bands yeah. that, that have some integrity to what they do actually go out of their way to try to accomplish. But I wanted to ask you as a younger musician, like is that, that idea of selling out and, uh, and dealing with uh, corporations still as out there and valid? I don't think it's as strict and such a big deal because there now there's this understanding like la uh, labels don't it's not the same like there's not this big swooping angel of a label that's going to come in and throw all this money at you and everything's going to be great it just doesn't exist like that and so you have to make <laughs> I don't think it ever did <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um, but you know what I mean like so there it's just I feel like it's a little different now and it's changed and so it's a uh, you just have to pick the right brands that you are okay with making an exchange with. And I don't know. I, 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 I really think people look at it much differently now than they did in the 90s, for sure. But you still can get in situations like with the car. And yeah. Like, basements and, where somebody's going to give you a hard time about it. And I mean, yeah, and that was so many years ago. And we, as I said, we literally no money and wanted to play these shows. And it really wasn't a big deal to me. I put some pictures of us like holding up a little rat outside of the car. That's not a big deal to me. That I don't feel like I'm compromising my music or my life or anything. You know, so... No, you're moving it forward. Exactly. So that was, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting... Uh, Topic and struggle. All right. Well, let, let, let's let's uh, let's move on to the next. Yeah. Yes. Okay. How has technology changed the way you approach your music, your fans, and your band? So the the connection is so much more intense than it's ever been before. So, um, Michelle, I'm put you back right back on the spot sure. here. Um, can you achieve what you want to achieve without really integrating technology into into what you do um, with your band at this point? The demand of social media to me is really exhausting. I'm, I'm also a journalist and a writer and have to been forced to do things, you know, Twitter is a big deal. And um, I mean, it's a great way to connect with your fans and have like less of a degree of separation, but it also feels exhausting a lot of the times yeah. and relentless and ultimately unimportant, you know? You have to take a picture of this and put it up and do this. It's just like, <laughs> Walter, do you feel that same? Do you feel that same tug? Yeah, I kind of like the old school separation. Uh, I thought it was fine, but I do appreciate that I get some joy out of other people's stuff too. So that's how I justify it. You know what I mean? Like I'll see other people's um, 
you know, Instagram post or whatever, and I'll be, I, I get some small joy out of that. So yeah, that's in good. that way, I can justify like thinking, all right, at South by Southwest, I got to take a picture of something and put it up. You know, that doesn't have to be a drag. That can be fun because I'm seeing other people's uh, things. It's a new job and I wasn't quick to uh, take it on. And there's people that are doing it way better than I am or, or more passionate, more interested or focused, career minded, whatever. But I think you have to, if you want to, um, I think it makes sense to participate and, and get into it and try to find a way that you enjoy it. Uh, and you know, it is, it's, it's, there's some good sides to it. But. It seems like it can be overwhelming. Is that, is that kind of what you were saying, Mish? That it, yeah. like the, the tail starts wagging the dog, right? It starts to take yeah. control. Well, it's <laughs> overwhelming. That's what it is. And I mean, are you jumping on there after every show to see what the people in the audience said about your performance? You could, if that's what you wanted to do. I'm not going to do that because <laughs> it would make me crazy. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, that's the thing, right? And right. then I feel like you become, people become really, that right after you're done playing and then looking up what people said, why don't you just go have a beer and enjoy that you just played? Yeah. Or have it, I, it's too much. What about you, Nate? I can't talk about it. it makes uh, I couldn't say it any, I feel exactly the same way Walter does. I, I'm, can people see this image? Is that some, on a screen somewhere? Yeah, it's right, it's right here. That's yeah, I mean, image. that's me. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's me because uh, I did a I did a solo uh, tour last year and nobody came and so I'm like oh, fuck I got, yeah. I got this social media thing and nobody came to that either <laughs> um, because I'm not really invested in it it still doesn't yeah. really make sense to me it's not how I care to interact it doesn't you know I'm not, I'm not there yet but it is it is a nice distraction it's I like it as a distraction not as the central way that you communicate with your fans okay there are good elements to it though where you know you've I've made connections with fans over Twitter and, and then they come to the show and they're like, oh, hi, remember I sent you this thing and that's really nice. So there's definitely positive things to it. I just get really ugh, overwhelmed. Got it. Okay. All right. So kind of at the heart of the matter here is the concept of authenticity, that word in and of itself, the, the concept in and of itself. Is that so hackneyed? Is that so overused at this point? that it really has lost its meaning. Is there a meaning of authenticity at this point? I think it's in danger of that for sure. It's a, very, it's a very broad term. Um, and I think when you, when you talk about terms like this, like we were discussing this earlier, and you used the word freedom, you know, like, yeah. I think if you're gonna use a word like freedom, which obviously gets thrown around in the election cycle a lot, like it makes, it makes sense to define what you're talking about and bring it down to something that's more tactile. Um, mm -hmm. The word authenticity, like, okay, are we talking about commercialization? Or are we talking about uh, being true to what your artistic inclinations are and not following a trend? Those are to two totally separate things. Are we talking about what happens when you've been on tour for six months and you don't want to play the show? Mm -hmm. And you got up and play it anyways because now it's, it's your job and people are relying on you to go out and do it. Mm -hmm. And you know that you're probably going to enjoy it tomorrow, but tonight you don't. Is mm -hmm. that very authentic? You know, like, I've... You know, I've coasted through shows before. Everybody has done it. You have to. Mm -hmm. it's not, you know, you're not, you're not enthusiastic every single night. So, I don't know. I, I don't think that the term. I don't. I would say that it's not the term itself. It's maybe how we we view language. And sometimes in a public forum, when you're when you're trotting out a word like authentic, authenticity or freedom, it's like you should probably may need to get a little more detail about what the definition is. Okay. Any other thoughts, Walter? Um. Yeah, I think it's a, a strange word, like what, what Nate was talking about. If you're just kind of beat and you got to go up there and kind of seem like you're excited, I guess, is that inauthentic? I think authenticity is maybe just a consistency or something in the story so that people get a sense that, you know, one part makes sense with the other. And uh, in some long-term way, then people kind of believe in it more. Um, and then if you start to look to authenticity to try to sell something, like, look how authentic this is. Let's sell it. I mean, you could do, you know, in the vinyl market or something or some clothing or some old kind of school thing like that. Like, people are collecting so much stuff these days. But as, like, a quality that something has and then you're trying to sell it, it just it seems like a little, you know, suspect. Okay. And, uh, and just it's sort of a strange word yeah to me the, in that sense to me and you guys just maybe just react to this the definition is really around 
being disciplined about the things that you absolutely are going to retain control of when it comes to your own identity mm -hmm. and also understanding where the things where you can be more flexible mm -hmm. but really staying disciplined around those things so nate you may be you may be more flexible when it comes to t-shirt designs but there's no one who's going to tell you guys what goes into the music itself just yeah. as, an, as an example um, so i think you, it's, it's kind of like where you make those decisions we're going to be absolutely black and white here this is where the gray area will exist and it's going to stay there does that make sense absolutely yeah, yeah i think when good. people and if people are following the story of that and the, whoever the artist is gets lazy the the you know where they're you know they're they're decision-making process gets, you know, lax for whatever reason, people start to notice and they're losing their authenticity, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's something, I mean, not in like, it, it just seems like a little bit of a, of a marketing word, but, um, but I think your relationship to your art and what you're doing in the way that you described it, I think is, is you know, a system by which you work. And, um, and I think people get a sense of that and it, over a period of time and then they, they buy into it and you stick with it that's that's a good thing. Yeah. I liked your definition and I think too when you're bringing brands into your work. I mean, it we all come from rock and punk, which is a genre that's very that even brings this question up. I mean, no pop star or rap star is going to get dogged for having like a cell phone in their video mm -hmm. or like doing that. You know, it's like this is very specific to the type of music we yeah, all came yeah. up in. This question doesn't exist for a lot of other musicians, mm. I think. Yeah. That's interesting. It's like, yeah. it's like a genre specific question. Yeah, it, it totally is. Mm. I mean, that's how I feel. Absolutely. And I wouldn't judge those artists for being like too commercial by my standards. It's just like what what kind of, you know, system are they creating, you know what I mean? Like, if yeah. it's okay for them to endorse a cell phone on stage, everyone loves it and everyone's having fun, yeah. then, like, what the hell, that's great. Yeah. You know, if I go, hey, I love my new cell phone, everybody, this is a cool song, and show it, then it would be like, that's strange, and that would break the, f yeah. the flow, you know yeah. what I mean? But it depends on how much the cell phone company money gave me to, like, deal, with, take the hit on that one, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and I think that's, as an artist, you know, you're talking about driving around in the, in the Sia, Scion. Scion, whatever. Like, um, you have to do stuff like that sometimes, and, and you pick the ones that are going to be most expedient to getting to the next town and make the thing happen. That. So eventually, you know, you can make it to South by Southwest and pay, play, yeah, you know, whatever, yeah. eight shows in one day or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> and, you, and really live the like dream. Like just did. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I think it's very um, genre specific and I th it's just, it has to do with the way that you come up into music. I mean, like yeah. we all started, I didn't start my band banking on it to be a career. I did it because I liked it and I was doing other things on the side, you know? Right. You know what I mean? Like you're not coming from that same position. So okay. those values aren't there. Great. All right. So before we go to Q&A, um, anybody who wants to ask a question can start queuing up right there at the mic. We're going to leave a few minutes for that. Can you guys each finish with maybe one reflection on what advice, you know, so you're a, a, you're a friend of a friend or a friend's son is starting a band and they need some advice about how you keep the wheels on your, your who you are, your own identity, your own art, while while you grow and commercialize that art, what's the what's the one lesson you're gonna share with that friend? Mm. Nate? That, <laughs> uh, I mean that's that's so hard. I've never mm -hmm. I've never seen a musician who is great and nobody knows about it. Or they don't know about it for a long time. I mean, I, I, I tell these people all the time, like, they're worried about, like, well, how do I get my music into the right hands or that kind of thing? Like, if somebody's creating great music, it's going to get discovered. Maybe you guys would, would disagree with uh -huh. me. And it, it's some, you know, that's going to, it's going to find an audience. No, I think you're right. Mm. You know, and so if you can, if, you know, advice for a young musician, if you continue to do what you do, it will, the, the results will speak for themselves. You'll find an audience if, if the music's of value. All right. So if you've been hammering, if you've been hammering it out for 20 years and you're not getting anywhere, then that should tell you something about about what you're playing. Or well, you'll get a documentary made about your band, and then yeah. you start, to, <laughs> yeah. and you'll start playing festivals. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's <laughs> like, what are you trying to get out of it? If you, you know, like if you get, like for myself, like I got into music because I wanted to play CBGBs. I wanted to have, 
you know, people, I wanted to be a part of that thing. I wasn't thinking that I wanted to be, I never thought to be a successful professional musician. So mm -hmm. I feel like from that background, I've just enjoyed the ride more. And that has been the goal, the actual just doing of it. Okay. So I think if you've been in it for 20 years or something and you haven't found any success, I, I would hope that that person would enjoy the doing of it. So maybe that's the advice I would give. Like, like all of it, try to get into the rehearsal, try to get into the booking, try to get into the trip, like with your friends and, and the people that you meet and all that, because that's really the best part of it. It's not like someday it's like, you're famous, everything's cool. Like then you have new problems. You have to be into the thing as it's happening and appreciate that, not having this, waiting for some validation to come from some magical place. It's know. very we're, Yeah, we're, we're lucky that way. Like, like some of my favorite times playing music have been in rehearsal. Yeah, you know? you're with your friends, you're doing mm -hmm. your thing, you're playing your music, and, and it's, that's magic. I mean, yeah, or you could be, be cool an actor, if, you know, like, yeah. you can't, you're not going to just go and act on Tuesday morning. You know? <laughs> yeah. oh, like, I feel bad go, for those guys. Go act right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any advice that you would My offer? only advice that I always say, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I think that when you start a band, you should always play with people that are better musicians than you, forces you to learn faster. Mm -hmm. And that's my only advice. Great least. advice. Yeah. That's great advice. Okay, and with that, can we just have a hand for our panel, please? Thank you. Okay, so why don't you just, why don't you just tell us uh, your first name and what you're doing here at South By, and then fire away with your questions. Yeah. Uh, my name's Reed, and I'm actually a researcher, so I get to come down and try to see how people enjoy and kind of experience festivals. Um, I am down here for work, and my company is one of those companies that may feel, like the, the beer company that may not feel great, or you may feel that you have to spend collateral if we were to put something on. But me as an individual, like my first show was Kid and Play and Public Enemy. My daughter already has two pairs of vans, and she's seven weeks. Um, so like I'm someone that does genuinely love these things, and what I would want to do is help my company transition from being somewhere that you have to spend collateral for to someone that actually can help support and be a steward of musicianship and bands is that possible do you feel that that a band that you if it's a beer company for instance that right now you don't feel good about playing for could they actually move and be someone that bands want to work with uh, absolutely I, mean, I don't know if please <laughs> you guys, yeah. anybody, go ahead. I think there's certain just cert depends on like, for example, I think to Mish's point, it's like depends on who you're who you're a fan of and who you're trying to get to work for your your product. Like, for a beer company, for some people it would be like, hell yeah, great. How much money you got? Let's do it. I'll yeah. drink it all day. What do you want me to do? Uh, but for a different kind of artist, that would just be um, more of a difficult decision. It would have nothing to do with the people that ask them or any mm -hmm. no no. There would be no like. You know, you're a nice guy, but, you know, this just isn't a good look for us. Mm -hmm. And I think there's certain products that are connected. I mean, basically, music is very connected to the alcohol business. It's pretty mm -hmm. much part of the same thing. So that's, it's kind of, in a way, silly to be, you know, too precious about it. Yep. But, um, you know, and maybe a new band would have absolutely no problem with it. I have not been personally, I haven't been put on the spot by a beer company. So when that time comes for me... Um, you know, I'll, I'll remember this time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work for a beer company. But <laughs> yeah, but I think if your company's cool and makes sense with the artist that you're trying to pursue, and it's coming from a place of where, you know, it's usually like, the reason that I, I'm associated with Vans because the people that ended up working at Vans were fans of, they were part of the same culture that I came up in. And so when they got in a position to say, hey, we can get a band to play at this place, let's get those guys. And then it's, we're all part of the same sort of family in, in that regard. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that you're meeting, um, you know, and Vans isn't the only brand that's doing that, yeah. but it's, you know, for my kind of genre of music, there aren't so many things, but I, I would be welcome for all offers, you know, who's, <laughs> what, you know, what do you got? Yeah. You know. So you, you think it still rings true when the brand's not cool, but it makes sense? Yeah, I think it's definitely a case by case thing. Your cigarette example, I thought, was really yeah. Uh, my friends, I mean, I would never do that because I think a 
I, I don't want people smoking. Sorry, I think yeah. it's bad. I've heard, you know, it's bad. There's no <laughs> about it. I wouldn't want anybody doing that. But for my friend's band, they um, had no problem with it. And they thought it was cool and they needed the money to get to the next yeah. town. Yeah. You know, so whether they're them endorsing cigarettes means that someone got is going to get cancer one day because they thought this band was so cool that they should start smoking too. I mean, it's kind of absurd. Yeah. But, um, you know, in terms of credibility to the band, you know, some people, they might, it might take a hit. In my point of view, that's their thing. I don't care. You know, I, I, I think they need the money, so they did it. It's kind of a corny analogy that might help. Think of any artist you work with as like a car. So you guys could, you guys, the, you could wrap the car in your in your company's logo or you could be the fuel inside the car and then as the car's going by you know somebody goes like that's a rad car and i wonder how it got from here to there and then it'll come it'll come about that you helped that get from here to there that's not corny that's by really good gasoline. yeah that's <laughs> awesome good night okay next question who are you and what are you doing here i my name is dave uh, i make music for video games and tv shows okay. uh, i'm here because i'm a massive Foo Fighters fan, and the Warp Tour is some of the best musical experiences I've ever had in my entire life. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, quick question for Nate, and then follow-up question for the board. Uh, quick question being, did Mentos like what you guys were doing with Big Me and, and during that era? You know, that's actually a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. We didn't get, uh, we definitely didn't get any legal letters that I know of. We didn't get shut down. Your they choice, did, right? That up. was not a tie-in with yeah. Mentos, just right. to be clear. That was no, the that foods was doing their own thing. Straight satire. Okay. Yeah. I yes. would guess that they were psyched. I think, How yeah, I think, it was, I think it was okay. So they didn't follow up and say, hey, great video. Let's sponsor your next tour or something like that. I bet they would now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I mean, because the band's more popular. I mean, just yes. Like it's, you know, and then my, you know what I'm saying. My uh, question for the group is, how do you guys feel about the way that you two released their album with Apple, and it, what, is there a way that that could have been done well? Hmm. I think it was a misfire, that whole thing. Why? Why, Walter? Because I got it on my phone, and I didn't ask for it. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, in this time of, that we live in, like, we're so inundated with stuff that we don't want and you two supposed to be our friend and they're, you know they're they're you know this i don't want to say trite they're not politically correct but they seem like to be on the force of good and now they just invaded my little space i think that was just a bad move i think they realized it pretty quickly i still can't get it off my phone yeah so how long <laughs> i was just gonna say there like, was two evils there the first yeah. one was the one you said the second was they made it impossible to get rid of and i think it was a very is that did they do that you can't get rid of it i don't know i can't get rid of it <laughs> yes it's called youtube Let's see, but so they now, have now to put a tutorial a job how to get it thanks off. bono yeah yeah that was like um, i don't want to do that it's yep. just sitting in my phone though miss you got a point of view on i was that just one? yeah i didn't i thought that was really it was, it was just like someone forcing you a meal that you don't want to eat or something, you know, and like, yeah, it was really intrusive and weird, and I don't think it was done right. And they also, why did they need to do that? They didn't. Yeah. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't need to do it. They messed the up. The funny thing is they thought they were doing everyone a favor. Yeah, they is thought that, they were but it, nice. Is that what it is? It's like... <laughs> Well, yeah, you know you want this. Yeah, but it was what it actually was is was it was an advertisement oh, for their band. Right. I didn't they like didn't. It. They knew it was that subconsciously or in, on some level. Uh, I think it came off was that way. But they're like, hey, we're just going to give you our music, and they're like, no, we don't. You're getting an ad for your band. Yeah. 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 That's what this is. Okay, we have time for cool. two more Thank questions. You. Thank you for that. All right. You, who are you, and what are you doing here? I'm Ellie. I'm a volunteer. Um, I was wondering what. Do you think has changed with the music backgrounds that you come from? With the uh, the, the 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 points of origin, or yes. um, I would think that um, because of all that this uh, like starting out, we're, I mean, we've been talking about you know cons commercialization, and you know uh, we we're talking about branding and associating with that. That was just didn't exist at that time. So the bar was incredibly low to like violate. The, the, the consensus to be like, oh no, you are, you are a sellout. Like, it could be the record label that you signed, that would be the, the quickest way to be branded a sellout. Right. Um, there could be po politics that you could be branded, you know. So I think probably now, the kids that have grown up that in the last 20 years, um, probably just it's so much blurrier because bands there you know when you talk about the major label system or 
um, where there was money in it and there was less bands, like I think at that time, or, you know, every one band that made a record represented, you know, 20, maybe not 20,000, but probably like several thousand that couldn't cut it. Whereas now everybody gets a chance at it. So you're, there's just a flood. So I don't think you can dictate the rules as, as intensely. I mean, that's my, that's my guess from, you know, my, you know, that's the pulse that I get. Anyone else want to add to that? No, I'm okay. Move on. Well put. Okay. Well put. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Last question. Who are you and what are you doing here? Hi, all. My name is Monica. I'm working production for the music festival. And I was wondering how you feel about the concept of the 360 deal. Like, with a label having that much power, does it compromise your authenticity? What do you think? <laughs> um... I think the 360 <laughs> deal is uh, it's just probably a, a matter of, of the, the business thing of it now because you can't, the record labels uh, can't make the money off the record sales as they once did and the bands want money in advance mm -hmm. and so that's the way that they protect themselves. I mean, when it first emerged, it seemed real sketchy, um, but I think the, the, the record deals before 360 were probably real sketchy too. They're giant, they're like this big, and there's all kinds of ways that they're ripping off the bands anyway. But I think um, there's maybe something more honest about a 360 deal now in the sense that uh, you know the money's not there because people don't buy records in the same yeah. numbers. And you know, I think that's the, that's the trick. Cool, right. thank you. <laughs> Anybody else add, want to add to that? I know very little about them. I haven't run into. <laughs> well, they're getting, they're uh, taking the T-shirt sales, and they're taking all kinds. Uh, oh, I think I know, publishing the, the and stuff concept, like that. But yeah. it's, it's not, it's not so much a thing now as it was like ten years ago. Yeah, I think not. I, I think, don't know anybody that's in a three hundred and sixty. Yeah, I don't. So you don't, don't hear it as much. It. I don't think. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, a uh, hand for our panel, and thank you guys for being here. Thank you. This better deck shoe with a rubber sole that looked like waffles and stuck like syrup.